I certainly wouldn't claim that atheists have no meaning in their lives, because that would obviously be false. Lots of things can be meaningful to people in various ways. The real difference between theism and atheism when it comes to meaning is the kinds and degrees of meaning available to us. So, by way of analogy, if you're a vegan, it's not that you have no food, it's that the range of foods available to you is much narrower than the range of foods available to someone who isn't a vegan. There are fewer options for you. Similarly, if you're an atheist, you might find meaning in what you do. But the kinds of meaning available to you are significantly reduced. I would argue that your varieties of meaning are almost completely limited to the realm of the subjective, mainly your feelings. Hence, atheism is the veganism of worldviews. If you'd like a mouth-watering ribeye steak, figuratively speaking, you need to go somewhere other than the veganism of worldviews. Fortunately, Pierce Morgan just did an awesome interview with the Christian scientist and philosopher Stephen Meyer. They spent most of the interview discussing scientific evidence for what Dr. Meyer calls the God Hypothesis. Later in the interview, Pierce had some questions about why an all-powerful creator would allow so much suffering in our world. This is the infamous problem of evil. But at the very end, Pierce had one final question. Final question. What's the meaning of life? Ending with an easy one, I see. Well, I think it ultimately is um, to come into a relationship with the creator who made the universe. Easy question, easy answer. In the closing chapter of my book, I talk about uh, Viktor Frankl and the man's search for meaning and how universal that is. And that nothing can mean anything to a rock or to an atom or to a planet. Things only mean things to persons. So if there is to be meaning in life, there must be genuine persons who, to whom we can mean uh, something and, and, uh, and who can mean something to us. Interesting point. To even have the possibility of meaning, there must be persons. Nothing is meaningful to a rock. But watch this. And yet, we all die. And so I think if there is a God, it reopens that question of ultimate meaning. The French ex existentialist used to say of Sartre, without an infinite reference point. Mm. Nothing finite has any lasting or enduring meaning. Right. For there to be meaning, there must be persons. But human persons are all going to die. Eventually, we'll all be dead. So, if we're the only persons, meaning will eventually die with us. Without an infinite reference point, there's no lasting meaning. But if there is an infinite reference point, and that infinite reference point is personal, that is to say, if the universe was created by a personal agent who wants to know mm. us, then the, then the possibility of enduring meaning is again on the table. Think about something that was meaningful to you at some point earlier in your life that just isn't meaningful to you anymore. I'll give you some examples. I grew up in several different places, mostly a trailer park in West Virginia. Back then, after school, we would build forts in the woods or shoot things with bows or rifles or play video games, first on the Atari 2600, which most of you are too young to have even heard of, and eventually on the original Nintendo, which was also before your time. And these things were incredibly meaningful to us when we were kids. I defeated Mike Tyson, one of the greatest boxers in history, numerous times on the video game Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. It's quite an accomplishment to defeat the heavyweight champion of the world in his prime. Take that, Jake Paul. I once won an archery competition. I remember being mad after the competition because they didn't give out any awards. It was just, you won, congratulations, he won everyone. Not even a ribbon. I thought I should have gotten a ribbon for doing something as meaningful as winning an archery contest. One year, my friends and I built a six-story fort. Then some other kids came along when we weren't there and tore it down. We later found one of those kids. He was dumb enough to walk through our trailer park after tearing down our fort. Let's just say he got punched in the face repeatedly, and when he ran, he dropped his backpack, and we threw his books all over the trailer park. Why? He destroyed our fort. We spent weeks building that thing. 
Now I look back at all of that and think, who cares about winning a video game? Who cares about winning an archery competition? I don't remember ever shooting a bow again after that. Who cares about the fort? Not me or any of us who built it. So, absolutely no one. These things that were so meaningful to us when we were kids, things that we were willing to fight over, just aren't as meaningful as we once thought. Eventually, everyone who was involved in any of those situations will be dead. There won't even be the memory of those things happening. So whatever meaning there was, it was limited. It was temporary. The question is, is all meaning like that? Is all meaning going to fade away? Well, if there's an infinite reference point, if that infinite reference point is personal, then there's the possibility of lasting meaning. Yeah, I mean, if you, I've had this conversation with Ricky Gervais. It's like, well, if everything, if you only believe that what happens in your existence here is that's it, how sort of pointless, transitory and vacuous it must all be to you. Whereas if you believe in the concept of, of inf infinite life, albeit in a different way, that's great. Am I the only one who thought that Pierce Morgan was about to do a Ricky Gervais impression? I don't know why I thought that. I've never seen Pierce do an impression of anyone. But if he had done an impression of Ricky Gervais, and the impression was absolutely hilarious, would it have been ultimately pointless? According to Ricky, yes. According to Pierce, no. That's the question that haunted me as a teenager. You know, I used to, Is it? Uh, yeah, it was, what, what's it going to matter in 100 years? No matter what I mm. worked on, no matter what I achieved, mm. no matter what goal I, I set, I, I thought I, I couldn't, what, what was the point? I thought the exact same thing when I was a teenager, but the realization affected me completely differently from the way it affected Stephen Meyer. I went, one time came across the quote from Bertrand Russell where he talks about all the, all the great labors of, mm. of the human race and the, the noonday, the, the brightness of human uh, achievement, noonday human achievement will, is destined for extinction in the vast death of the solar system. <laughs> I wasn't much fun at parties as a teenager. <laughs> so, teenaged Stephen Meyer found it depressing to think that everything he ever did would ultimately be meaningless. Teenaged David Wood found it exhilarating. Teenaged David Wood thought to himself, yes, everything I do is meaningless. But everything that everyone else can do to me is also meaningless. So I might as well do whatever I want, and who cares what the rest of you do in response? At a certain point in life, whether it's when you're very young or often when you're nearing the end, those sorts of questions percol Particularly, I think, when you get near the end. Yeah. They, they when you're really questioning, am I right? Is this yeah. Young people ask what the point is because they're looking forward. What's the point of everything I'm about to do in life? Old people ask what the point is because they're looking backward. What was the point of everything I just did in life? And looking forward, is there something still to come? Yeah. It just seems to me completely in the same way that when atheists can't explain what happened before the Big Bang, uh, and when they can't say that, and when they say nothing happens when you die and stuff, that's where my belief in God gets in massively increased. Here, Pierce is just pointing out that atheists have trouble offering satisfying answers to some of the big questions. Yes, they do. It's one of the main reasons I think it must, there must be a God is that actually none of that would make sense, that we just started one day and there was this weird thing called nothing before there, which no one can really explain to me what that is. And at the end of it, it just ends and then that's the end of that. Pierce is making a good point here. If there's only meaning when there are persons, and if persons are this cosmic accident, this temporary blip of meaning in a sea of meaninglessness, then there's no meaning followed by meaning suddenly popping into existence, followed by a return to meaninglessness for all eternity. But if there's an infinite reference point, then there's always been meaning, and there always will be meaning. So meaning isn't an anomaly. It's an eternal part of reality. 
that doesn't make any sense, that someone would create something so extraordinary that's led to us, the human being, and then at the end, that's it. Well, that is not bad, Piers. You figured out a huge issue. Now you just need to figure out how to keep your guests from screaming over each other when you host debates. Hint, your tech guys have the ability to cut people's mics. That's the other thing about the grief emotion, is that it, it seems to be telling us there's something profoundly unnatural, mm. not intended by death. Someone dies and you experience grief. What's the point of the grief? It's as if there's a part of you crying out that something isn't the way it's supposed to be. To me, when I look inside the cell and see the evidence of that digital storage transmission and processing system, Richard Dawkins himself said, upon seeing an animation of this recently, that he was knocked sideways with wonder at the, the intricacy and complexity of the digital information processing that's going on inside cells. Sadly, Richard Dawkins has admitted that nothing could even possibly convince him that God exists. He admitted that even if he heard an audible voice speaking to him, even if he saw a message written out to him in the stars, he still wouldn't believe. That's faith. This is extraordinary. It's like, it's like a, a, a 3D printer. You've got yeah. digital code directing the construction of yeah. three-dimensional structures and machines all inside the tiniest recesses of the cell. There is no materialistic chemical evolutionary or other account of that. Your DNA is a set of instructions for building you. And the cells of your body are filled with tiny machines that read the set of instructions, translate the instructions, and build the necessary structures. What does this all point to? We see features inside the cell that are reminiscent of our own high-tech information and digital technology. This seems to be pointing, obviously, to a transcendent mind. Fun discussion. Putting it all together, human beings have this quest for meaning. But lasting meaning requires an infinite reference point. Science points to this infinite reference point. And so, one of the greatest human desires, ultimate meaning, lines up perfectly with one of the greatest human endeavors, scientific investigation. I don't recall ever believing in God when I was little. I think I was around 13 years old when I officially realized that I was an atheist. I was probably around 14 or 15 when I concluded that I only believed certain things were right or wrong because I'd been programmed by society. And I must have been around 16 or 17 when I concluded that everything is ultimately meaningless. I noticed that most other people found what they did meaningful. I regarded their belief in meaning as a kind of delusion, a crutch to help them get through life. As I said, as far as I was concerned, we might as well do whatever we feel like doing with the little bit of time we've got. So that's what I did. And I ended up in a couple of jails, a couple of mental hospitals, a few prisons. Going to jail would bother most people, and on a superficial level, I didn't want to be locked up but on a deeper level, I just didn't care. What's the difference between, on the one hand, going to school, spending 40 years working, and then retiring, shriveling up, and waiting to die? And on the other hand, doing whatever you feel like doing, crushing anyone who gets in your way, and spending life in prisons and mental hospitals. Who cares? Better to burn out than to fade away. I was in jail when I met a Christian, the first Christian I ever met who put up a fight when I started arguing with him. He made me so mad that I began studying Christianity to show him that he was wrong. Along the way, I figured out some of what Stephen Meyer talked about in his interview with Pierce Morgan. The evidence of design in nature caused me to doubt my atheism. I also studied the resurrection of Jesus, and before that I had no clue that all of the core claims surrounding the resurrection are grounded in history. All the evidence we have tells us that Jesus died by crucifixion. All the evidence we have tells us that he was alive again later. That looked like it might be a miracle, 
And combined with some of the other things I was studying, it made me think that I should at least say a prayer. And when I sat up from that prayer, the entire world looked different. Everything was instantly infused with meaning. I still had to spend several years in prison, but it was the best time of my life up until then. I knew God. I knew the one who created the universe. I was connected to the infinite reference point. Care to join me?